All right, thank you, Chuck. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I want to specifically mention to Kenna that I did just sign the release form, so you can tweet and film and Facebook all you want. Um, let's see, how does this work? Okay. Uh, so, um, and of course, I'm representing a large group of people here. Um, so you may think, because I'm, today I'm talking about the somatic landscape of GBM, and you may think, um, I'm sure there's an easier way to do this. Oh, there. You may think a GBM marker study, didn't we already have one of those? And that's, of course, correct, because we started in 2008 by uh, publishing uh, on the comprehensive genomic characterization of GBM. Um, and that was sort of the kick of publication to the entire TCGA. And then we followed that in 2010 by two papers, uh, one describing uh, gene expression subtypes and a second one uh, describing a hypermethylator phenotype. So uh, the, the data set that we used for those three papers um, is sort of represented here. Uh, we had DNA sequencing of about 600 genes in about uh, 91 cases. At that time, of course, a, an enormous amount of sequencing, uh, whereas nowadays you can do that in a day. Um, and we had molecular profiles and copy number profiles on a, on a uh, sample cohort of about 200 cases. So fast forward to 2012, um, now we have exome sequencing on 300 cases or close to 300 cases. We have copy number on almost 600 and we have some form of molecular data on about 600 samples. So this is really quite a large data set. Um, importantly, we also have whole genome sequencing um, of 17 samples and RNA sequencing on, of 164 samples. Um, first, we uh, looked for significantly mutated genes using the 300 or close to 300 exomes. You'll see that the top um, uh, genes are the ones that we saw in our 2008 paper as well, P53, EGFR, P10, sort of the usual suspects. Um, but we also find a bunch of novel genes uh, that have previ previously been unassociated with cancer, and glioblastoma in specific. So for instance, there's SPTA1 that is uh, mutated in 10% uh, in of the cases, ATRX, TCHH, uh, and so on, and these genes are all free, uh, present at frequencies above 3%. So this slide summarizes uh, the 26 most significantly mutated genes uh, with the 300 samples on the x-axis and the genes on the y-axis. Um, first, I'd like to point out that we uh, see um, no significant gene mutation in about 10% of samples. That's sort of remarkable in my mind, although we see that in most tumor types. Uh, we see interesting patterns of mutual exclusivity, such as um, there's never, a, co uh, never a, a mutation in both PIK3R1 and PIK3CA, which obviously makes sense as these are working in, com in complex. And we also see interesting patterns of co-occurrence. For instance, all the cases with an IDH1 mutation also harbor a mutation in P53, and the majority of IDH1s harbor a mutation in ATRX. And this has been uh, recently reported by Vogelstein and colleagues, um, that these also co-occur in lower grade oligodendrogliomas. I'd also like to point out that we found uh, a five BREF V600E mutations. Uh, these are of course of interest because they are very frequent in melanoma and respond uh, to vemurafenib in that disease. Although in other diseases such as colon cancer, these have also been described, uh, but they were not sensitive. So uh, it doesn't automatically translate to a treatment. Um, as John Weinstein showed this morning, uh, we also look for um, uh, patterns of mutation in chromatin modifiers, as these have recently gained great interest in different diseases. Uh, we compiled a gene set of 167 genes thought to uh, relate to chromatin modification. And we then uh, plotted the mutation, mutations in these 167 genes, as you can see in this slide. And we find that about 40% of GBM has a mutation in at least one of those. And these occur in a strikingly mutually exclusi uh, exclusive uh, fashion. Now we tested this for significance uh, by doing 10,000 permutations of similar sized gene sets. And we found that in 97% of these permutations, uh, we find a, a lower number of cases to harbor a mutation, thereby suggesting that this finding is quite significant. Um, as I mentioned, we have a very large number of copy number profiles. And in 2008, we, we, we reported on about 200 GBMs, 
And we found a number of uh, significant uh, amplifications as is shown in this logistic figure where you have all the chromosomes on the y-axis and each of the peaks represents a focal uh, region of copy number gain. Um, now fast forward again to 2012. Um, we find more peaks also because we have a better methodology. Um, but we also importantly find that most of these peaks harbor only a single gene. Similarly, we find this for uh, focal uh, copy number loss, and I've, I want to highlight QKI at uh, 6Q26, which is now the only uh, gene in this region, and this has previously been thought to target uh, PARC2. So we looked at genomic rearrangements uh, using uh, whole genome sequencing data. This is a specific copy number locus, chromosome 12Q15. Uh, this is a locus that harbors MDM2, and each of these lines here represents a copy number rearrangement between two chromosomal segments. So as you can see this, in this specific sample, uh, there's many uh, genomic rearrangements. And we could actually assemble all those genomic rearrangements into an extra chromosomal uh, ring structure, also known as a double minute, and this was confirmed by FISH. Uh, as CO1 uh, showed you this morning, we looked extensively for fusion transcripts. Um, and we found 84 in-frame fusion transcripts. We also found a number of out-of-frame fusions um, in 164 GBMs. Um, I want to highlight FGFR3 TAC3, as this was recently published. Uh, just like the one C1 uh, talked about this morning, TFG, uh, this is a local, uh, a small inversion. Um, since we have, and we have two cases that harbor, harbor this fusion event, and in both cases, this is the copy number profile, we see that this, uh, uh, it tags along with a focal uh, amplification. We found a number of EGFR targeting uh, uh, fusions. They don't, do not necessarily involve EGFR as a fusion partner, but all of these uh, occur um, in the area of an EGFR amplification. So these are 11 samples that have an EGFR associated fusion. Uh, so this is EGFR here in the middle, um, and the, the red indicates the area of fo uh, focal copy number gain. So this suggests that there's a more complex uh, event going on at this locus. We looked for intragenic rearrangements, uh, starting with the V3 deletion that has commonly re been reported in GBM. Uh, the V3 deletion uh, targets exon 2 to 7 uh, and, and uh, falls in the extracellular uh, domain of uh, EGFR. And this is also the domain uh, where the majority of point mutations occur. We then searched for C-terminal deletions, and we found three different C-terminal deletion variants, um, but we are likely undercalling the true number of C-terminal deletions, uh, as those would not result in a fusion transcript with reads on both sides of the, the deletion. So the 6.4% that we report is likely undercalling. And then we um, uh, also showed this morning, we also find uh, two novel variants, or at least relatively unknown. There's a few incidental reports on this. Uh, that target exon 12 and 13, or exon 14 and 15. If you now combine all the data on EGFR um, uh, <coughs> uh, using, all, using all our samples, we find that 45% uh, uh, of GBM harbor an, an EGFR-associated point mutation or uh, genomic alteration uh, aside from the focal amplifications that we see. So EGFR is clearly one of the most critical genes for gliomogenesis and uh, uh, efforts to devise an EGF EGFR therapy would still be very worthwhile. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we have previously looked for molecular subtypes. Uh, we found a G-SIMP or hypermethylator phenotype that fell entirely within the expression proneural group, and we also described a neural, a classical, and a mesenchymal uh, expression group. This slide shows you the data of about 330 cases uh, sorted by uh, molecular subtype, um, and each of the rows indicates a genomic uh, change, and it highlights associations between genomic abnormalities and uh, molecular subtypes. For instance, there's the association between IDH1 mutation and GSIMP, which we, of course, uh, have previously found, and we now also see that most of these have a MIC amplification. Similarly, we find EGFR amplifications in classical, but we also see cyclin E1 uh, in the classical group, and so on and so forth. Um, importantly, we confirm that the G-SIMs uh, do a whole lot better in terms of outcome than the uh, four non-G-SIMP expression groups. 
And we challenge a bit of paradigm here because if you look specifically at the non-GSIM samples, you'll see that the proneurals uh, without GSIM do worse than other groups, uh, whereas this was previously thought to be one of the better survivor groups. Uh, lastly, we have our PPA-based protein expression profiles. So I have to disappoint Doug Levine because we also looked at this in the context of uh, the gene expression groups. Um, uh, for instance, of course, PG, uh, phospho EGFR is highly expressed in the classical group, which also had all the EGFR amplifications. And we also see, although it's not as visual, but we also see a, a small decrease in the apoptosis module, so a, num a number of proteins that combine form an apoptosis module. We see a decrease in expression in that module, in the classical group. So in summary, uh, I described comprehensive genomic profiling of about 600 samples. Um, and we detected uh, novel significantly mutated genes, such as SPTA1, LCTR, and so on. Uh, we used whole genome and RNA sequencing to detect genomic rearrangements, most notably involving EGFR. And lastly, I want to again point out that the preneural class may actually perform worse than other subtypes. Um, I want to thank Linda Chin, Cameron Brennan, and Aaron McKenna, with whom I have co-led this uh, project. And I want to thank the people in my lab, most notably C. Yuan and Rahul, who performed a lot of the analysis that you saw today. And lastly, the TCJ GDEC at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you. Any questions for Rule? I have one, which is, um, so is EGFR amplification, is that occurring in double minutes? Um, or is it in the chromosomes or what? So the double minutes that we have seen, we have seen two different double minutes. So two individual whole genome samples had one. Um, they both are, uh, contained MDN2, but one of the two additionally had portions of chromosome 7. So it was a chromosome 7, chromosome 12 double minute, and indeed it also contained EGFR. So I was going to ask, the, the significantly mutated genes that are new, do you think they are biologically significant? Um, well, of course, we don't have any functional data. Um, in terms of the statistics, I would argue that they are. Uh, the, the, the methods we have to identify significantly mutated genes, I think, have improved. And um, based on those methods, we would argue that these are biologically significant. Um, but we don't have the functional data to support that notion. Following Chuck's question, um, I noticed, and, and David, there's some uh, significant mutation of PDGFRA, and I think Eric Collins' group at MSKCC had reported uh, intragenic rearrangements in PDGFRA similar to those in EGFR. Did you observe a significant number of those rearrangements as well? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, so PDGFRA indeed has small uh, exon 89 deletions, uh, and we see those, but at much lower frequency. Very, actually, I, maybe one or two percent, I would say. Um, how does uh, MGMT promoter methylation play into your survival analysis? Um, that's also a good question. Uh, we do have MGMT uh, uh, methylation status. Um, I don't think, if I remember correctly, it doesn't specifically track with one of the molecular subtypes, um, but we haven't corrected for it in the survival figures that I showed you. Thank you, Will. Uh, 